Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who are quite literally transforming the future. Today, we've got one of them. We've got Bercy Mesco on the program. Thanks for coming today. It's Bert Holland, but he goes by Bercy. So we'll do that and see how it goes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on, The Medical Futurist. You, uh, you talk about some really interesting stuff. I want to quickly dive into your background and then go, uh, go a little bit bigger. So what's your story? Yeah, let's do that. Um, well, um, my background is I'm a medical doctor with a PhD in genomics, but my story starts at the age of six when I got an encyclopedia made for kids from my mother. And there I learned about the scientific method, which is you know quite simple. We don't understand something, we do research about it, and then we understand that. And, and I fell in love with this process. And then at the age of six, I realized that I, I wanted to become a researcher in medicine, so a medical researcher. And I did that, but uh, when, I, when I finished my PhD and I fulfilled that childhood dream um, six years ago, I felt like something was missing from my life. And that was my love for technologies because I've been living my whole life as a real geek. And I felt like doing research in genetics is, is a unique opportunity in research and science, but I can't focus on what I love the most, uh, talking about how artificial intelligence, robotics, variable sensors, all these disruptive innovations shape the future of medicine, healthcare, and research altogether. And as I said, there was no profession I could you know, just jump into that could deal with all these. I had to design a new one, and that's how I, I launched uh, the Medical Futurist channels many years ago. That's how I became the Medical Futurist. And then later I launched the Medical Futurist Institute. So now we have two arms. In one arm, I have a team of uh, 13 creative, amazing people supporting the goal of uh, bringing healthcare to everyone. By this, I mean that we talk about how digital health technologies create um, a cultural transformation of healthcare and how policymakers, patients, physicians, researchers, developers can prepare for all that. And at the Medical Futurist Institute, we do the same, but we do that through peer-reviewed research. We publish papers, original studies. We try to investigate the background of all these cultural changes and, and technological revolutions. So I think to sum it up, um, my or our job now is to provide context about how these digital health innovations um, shape the, fu the fundamental basics of the patient-doctor relationship, the, the way healthcare is provided, the way medicine is practiced. And it's my personal mission um, about all these things to help people deal with that because I'm a very practical kind of guy and I, I want to bring out you know, practical guides, books, eBooks, um, some kind of a guidance about how to move forward with this, how to cherish the human touch in the age of advanced technologies. Basically, there's too many specialists and they don't know how to explain anything to a lay person. So your average Joe has no idea what's coming. You guys help the average Joe understand where we're headed and also corporations and big business as well. Yeah, we've, well, we had a, a group rush up a few weeks ago and we realized that we had to say that loud that we are the policemen of digital health. So if a company overclaims what they can do, what they can deliver, then we have to buzz them. If a company is doing something amazing, but they don't get enough exposure, then we also have to provide them with our channels and with our exposure to about half a million followers every day. Um, so it sounds funny to be the policeman of digital health, but actually it's, it's, um, it's a very exciting job because there are so many technologies you could easily overhype and it's fair, hard to you know, find a thin line. But also we, there's, there are reasons to be excited about the future of healthcare and, and we want to bring this, this optimistic vision, this, this utopistic scenario to people that they can, you know, they can believe in the notion that things can get much better, even in healthcare. So people have read a lot of sci-fi. They might have heard a lot of claims, et cetera. But I'm curious to get it from, from you, from the, from the goat's mouth, so to speak. Where are we headed in the next five to 10 years? What are the most exciting technologies on the frontier? Well, um, you mentioned sci-fi, and that's um, you know, a soft spot for me. I'm, I'm, I'm an addict of science fiction. Uh, in movies and books, I have to digest those every day because that's where my, my inspiration comes from, the, the kind of feeling that y you have to ask yourself the what-if questions every single day, uh, which these hard questions should not be part of your everyday life, but by, by watching and reading science fiction uh, and by asking these what-if questions, I, I'm, I'm forced to think about ethical considerations and utopias, dystopias. So gradually we, we can prepare for the future much better that way. 
if if it's the the time period is just five or ten years, then um, I hope that by that time we can easily say out loud that patients are the point of care. You know, since since Hippocrates for two thousand years, medicine has been quite a, a straightforward process. We have been the medical professionals. We are being trained to become semi gods. We know everything, obviously, and then when people come to us for help, we tell them what to do because we know everything. We read all the studies. There are 30 million studies out there and one, two million come out every year, but still we read everything. And with our expertise and experience, we help them. And then they, we, we you know, push them out of the, the ivory tower of medicine and then patients either comply with the therapy we just discussed or they don't. Actually, half of them do, half of them don't. That's, that's quite a bad success rate for any industry out there. That has been the way medicine has been practiced. And in the 21st century, many things have changed with uh, social media, crowdsourcing, Amazon, new technologies becoming accessible worldwide. And because of these, the ivory tower is breaking down. Uh, any patient now can access almost any medical studies. They can crowdsource really complicated diagnostic issues and, and treatment issues. They can reach out to fellow patients worldwide, even in rare conditions. They can have second opinion, even many of them through telemedical services. So many things have changed. And the, as the ivory tower is breaking down, what we need now is not a technological revolution, but a cultural transformation of healthcare. The way this hierarchy of the demigods and the patients who are passive elements in the system, we are transforming that into an equal level partnership where me as a, a professional partner and my patient as a patient partner, we can work on a solution for their health problems. And that's the, that's the biggest change anyone can anticipate in the next few years. And I can, I can summarize this, I mean, this group of changes as one thing that you have to become the hospital yourself. It shouldn't matter where you are coming from, how much money you've got, what language you speak, or whether you have access to a you know, physical facility, a point of care, you should be able to get care, diagnosis, and even treatments wherever you are, even tailored to your own metabolic genomic needs and, and your own lifestyle changes. And that, that's how we summarize it. Patients have to become the point of care. And that tailoring is becoming cheaper and cheaper with personalized genetic testing, with easy access to the doctors, as you were saying, with gut exactly. micro... Uh, I think 30 minutes ago, I published uh, my own analysis of my own whole genome sequencing service. A company sequenced my entire genome, and I learned so much about the future of my health, also the limitations of the service. But now I have my whole genome sequence at home. I brought it to my GP to discuss the prevention plan that we are working on. And um, I'm trying to reduce luck in our lives. Um, I, I know for those who, you know, hear it for the first time that our lives depend on luck. It's quite a harsh statement. But if you think about it, even if you, if you are wealthy, if you live in a great developed country with amazing healthcare system, your life is, you know, is still depending on a huge amount of luck and the decisions of others. And that's what I want to reverse. I want my life to depend on more on decisions and less on luck. It's, I think it's now about 80% luck, 20% decisions. I would be okay with the, the vice versa scenario. Yeah, it's that, it's that one saying, life is 10% um, what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And this is very similar. It's thinking ahead though. How do you think about individuals getting genetic tests in terms of the ethics of that, the ethics of possibly health insurance companies getting it, or possibly you finding out you have something, some incurable, intractable disease? Should everyone get these tests done? How do we think about it? Oh, that's a, a great group of very hard questions in the ones. Um, let's start with first the notion that it's my freedom of choice if I want to get my genome sequence. If it's my freedom of choice if I want to get a fitness tracker and track the number of steps I take a day. Uh, there is no, in my vision, there is no difference regarding the data I can measure about myself. You know, it's part of my life to, to um, become proactive about how I live my life, what kind of lifestyle changes I introduce to my every days. So no one should have a say in whether I can buy a direct to consumer genomic test, a whole genome sequencing service or a fitness tracker if I want to. That's I think the you know, step number one. Step number two is that how accurate these services can be. And that's, that's the hardest part for me because my background is in genetics. And I, when you are you know, into something, 
you see all the pitfalls and the, the potential issues. And that's what I say in genetics, that even though I, I could analyze my whole um, um, genome analysis myself, it was very hard to draw clinical conclusions that lead to you know, practical uh, suggestions in my life. Even though I learned a lot, I'm, I'm not sure that if we could discover all the issues that, that are hidden in my genomic data. So for this, we need genetic counselors, medical professionals trained at this, and the proactive partner, the patient, who we all participate in one group project to get the most out of our genomic, in my genomic data. So that's, that's the hardest part, how we can make sure that the, the companies, the, the claims of these companies are viable and scientifically correct. In the US, we, we've seen the stories in the last few years about this, how the, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, shut down all these uh, direct-to-consumer DTC services years ago and how they started letting some of them come back again to the market and make their tests available. And I think they are more, now the FDA itself is more um, rigorous about how they approve such tests. But the first pharmacogenomic test uh, made by a direct-to-consumer genomic service was just approved about three or four weeks ago, which is an amazing uh, step forward. But if when the human genome project was completed more than 20 years ago, you would have told me that in 20 years, we would have, you know, a few dozens of scientific examples with evidence-based background that you can use genomic changes uh, in treatment plans and in diagnostics. I would have said that, you know, that's impossible. We, we would have millions of these tests available by now. And still, it's a you know, very hard path uh, forward. And the third part of your question about the, the ethics here, well, um, I think the best um, ethical rule or law is, is in the US, it's called GINA, the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, that makes sure that no employer or no insurance company can ask for the results of your genetic testing service. And even if you want to share that with, the, with them, you are not allowed to. That's exactly the kind of thin line we, the wall we need between a desire to share the results of a genetic test and the way these companies would like to know more about me. In other countries, like in Europe, in many countries in Europe, the only rule we have is that they cannot ask for my test results, but if I want to share that with them, I, I can still do that. And that's, I think that just doesn't um, defend, protect the, the, the values and the privacy of patients enough. So actually the US is quite ahead what if someone else? What if someone else shares that? So Equifax's business model was stealing all your information and then selling it to essentially credit company, selling it to people that wanted to lend you loans. You never gave them any of the information. They essentially stole or bought the information wherever possible. That's a great point. You know, many of these companies ask you before you submit your your sample whether you want to let your data use for research purposes, which doesn't mean that they would share it with third parties, but in practice that. That's what it means. If my DNA is in a bucket of um, you know, samples for, from one million people, you can still tell if my DNA is in that bucket. So we are quite recognizable by our genomic data. And, and we know like companies like 23andMe are making a lot of money by selling the data of their customers to third parties, usually pharmaceutical companies that want to do research based on that huge amount of data set. So that's, that's one point, how they can use it. Actually, I'm not... Of course, I'm worried about how these companies sell our data to third parties, but I'm, I'm becoming more worried about how customers, patients, would start selling their own data to third parties. Uh, there, there are companies in the US now that, that offer you whole genome sequencing services for free, and then it, they, are, they store it on the blockchain, and then they allow you to sell parts of your genomic data for research purposes to third parties, usually pharma companies, so you actually make money out of your own data. That, that's what I'm more worried about. Why are you scared companies. about that? Why are you worried about that? Because now at least we have a few rules that make sure that, that try to make sure that patients don't lose much of their privacy, even when companies want to steal parts of it. But when they are willingly give up parts of their privacy, then rules have no saying in their lives anymore. And um, if patients want to make money based on their data or from their genomic data, I think they will do that. If companies can offer that through the blockchain and they, they claim that it's encrypted and it's secure based, you know, using that technology, then they will start selling it. And from there, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's the first steps of a dystopian nightmare 
that he would like to avoid. Well, we can already see this with GDPR. Something pops up and you're like, okay, I don't care. Just get it over with so I can get back to <laughs> exactly. Facebook. And it, it, it's a similar problem. People are willing to give up, give up that privacy. What about, what about if we jump further out, 25 years-ish? What, what technologies, what trends are you most excited about? 25 from now means that we almost reached artificial general intelligence. You know, Nick Bostrom, the biggest expert of AI, had uh, laid out the three levels of AI in his book, Super Intelligence. The first layer, the first level is artificial narrow intelligence, which we already have in our cars, in the Amazon recommendation system, in Google search engines. And then the second level is artificial general intelligence, which means approximately it means that such an AI system would have the cognitive capacity of you and or, or you and me. And then the third level artificial super intelligence means one of these algorithms has the cognitive capacity of the you know humanity, which means we are doomed. That's the Terminator scenario for sure. And I think experts are shooting for just not reaching artificial general intelligence, trying to stay below that level. But in 25 years, we could almost get there, which means all the data we have been obtaining in healthcare for hundreds of years, and that's, we, that's what we do still today, could be used to, to analyze on the level of populations. So um, I could be told by my GP that um, I can keep on having this bad lifestyle habit, but based on one million other people, similar people like me, age, gender, habits, you know, metabolic changes, genomic background, very similar people to me who kept on doing the same lifestyle habit, you know, it led to this or that medical condition at a, for a chance of 95%. That, that can be quite, you know, persuading to change lifestyle based on such huge amounts of data. So in 25 years, if all the systems we use in healthcare are not constantly analyzed and, and upgraded by artificial general intelligence, then it means that we haven't become the point of care. It means we haven't been able to culturally transform healthcare. And we still have a system that is not that is error prone, a system that's full of bad decisions, side effects, and a lack of information for patients. I think the the differentiation between AGI and ASI is just it's pointless really, because once you reach artificial general intelligence, you have something that's improving itself. And if it's improving itself, it's improving at machine type speeds, which means it goes from being human level to a hundred million human level in a day. It's okay. just, I, the definitions I've always found a little bit strange. I, I think maybe, uh, the, maybe the distinction between the two levels could be that uh, AGI could still be in a black box while ASI cannot. That's just, you know, got out. Maybe that, that could help make a distinction. I think Nick Bostrom mentions something like that in his book, uh, how to progress from AGI to ASI. Possibly. I feel like if you create something at least as intelligent as yourself, it could be orders of magnitude more intelligent and playing dumb. There's not really some way you can contain something smarter, but that's a, it's, it's a totally different conversation. I think we are heading in really, really interesting, interesting directions. What... Um, I know you're, you're a little bit of a biohacker. You seem to be someone who's focused on staying healthy, helping other people stay healthy, and I imagine living longer. What, uh, what are some of the things that you do? Well, um, I shoot for about 100. You know, that's, that's not an optimistic. That's, you know, quite a viable option that people like me in, at this age have right now. Um, How old are you? 33. Okay. So I shoot for at least 70 more. And then I see myself boarding a spaceship to Mars at the age of 100 and die there, like Elon Musk said, not on impact, but you know, peacefully after a few years, taking a look around. That's my plan. Um, I, I, in the Medical Futurist team, we kind of have to um, um, realize that I have to live like someone from 10 years from now. So I can show people what kind of chances they would have with digital health tools 10 years from now, when digi the digital health transformation becomes quite progressed. So I use a few, a few trackers in my, in my everyday. I use a fitness tracker to make sure that I exercise enough. Uh, I don't, I ha even have to care what kind of exercises I do. So I do functional training uh, three times a week and I run three times a week, even though I hate running and I think just, you know, going out for a run is against human nature. But I still do that because um, I found that data could be quite a good motivation for me. So I use different gadgets, chest strap, uh, fitness tracker on my wrist, 
and sometimes even different ones which I'm testing to go out for a run and to see the progress that, that I'm making is, is a good enough motivation for me to go out again and again. Why not biking? Uh, it's so much better on your joints or swimming. I don't know. I'm, I'm, it, it, has, it has never been my thing. Uh, with the travel schedules I have, I have, I had to find the, the simplest, fastest kind of exercise. And it's it, under any weather circumstances, day and night, I can still go out for a run, even though I'm not enjoying it genuinely. But the, the functional training part is, is the one that I enjoy three times a week. Uh, the, the most important thing I started doing with these trackers is, is obviously not just sleep tracking, but using a smart sleep alarm. So that, I think the holy grail of digital health is not you know, fitness trackers and chest straps, uh, ECG devices, but a smart sleep alarm. The fact that I can make sure to wake up at the best time every morning is, is the most wonderful thing in my experience in digital health. So when you, know, you wake up in the morning and you need five cups of coffee just, just to be able to wake up, uh, to get up from your bed, or you wake up and you are good to go, well, sometimes the difference is two minutes. And you can't tell because you are asleep. And you can't have somebody sitting next to you because it's quite creepy. And then even those people couldn't make sure that uh, you, you are being woken up, woken up at the best slot. So what I do is I use a sleep tracker every night and I give it 20 minutes. Uh, I usually wake up between 5.40 and 6 a.m. In those 20 minutes, it can find the best spot when I'm just getting out of deep sleep into light sleep. And with one, one gentle vibration, I wake up very easily. And I just, I can start doing my, my stuff immediately. That, that's a life-changing experience. Sleep tracking itself is fun and it's good to know the quality of sleep you have and what makes you have a bad night's sleep or what can improve your sleep. That, that's great. That's a good knowledge about yourself. But the holy grail of fitness tracking is, is uh, the smart sleep alarm. How are you doing that? What, are, what keys are you looking for, or cues, and what, what equipment are you using? I use for sleep tracking, for fitness tracking, I use a Fitbit Ionic. And I think Fitbit is great at fitness tracking and very bad at sleep tracking. Uh, I've been bombarding them with my messages. And also, also my community now started many uh, forum suggestions uh, on the Fitbit forum about launching the smart sleep alarm because they don't have one. It, it's ridiculous and unbelievable. So I have to use a Fitbit for fitness tracking uh, during the day. And during the night, what, what really matters is not the tracker you are using, but the application. So if you have an Android device, then you are lucky because the best app in the world is uh, Sleep as Android. That's an amazing app with tens of millions of users and a lot of data that they use to, to give you suggestions about how you perform on the long term. And um, first I just learned that um, what I really need is not, not, it's not about the length of my sleep session, but how much deep sleep I have. So even if I had, I, I tried to have eight hours of sleep, but I didn't uh, use those features I know would improve my sleep. So I, I only had a few, you know, very short periods of deep sleep um, sessions. I was not energized for the whole day. But when I just slept for six hours, but I had good deep sleep sessions, I was quite okay. So after a few, two weeks or so, I realized that for me, deep sleep is the key here. It's, I think it's different for everyone. And it's, even how, how well you can sleep is, is quite based on your genetics so uh, everyone has to find out for themselves so i use the sleep as android app and they have a list of compatible devices I, i'm using one of them on the pebble time which doesn't even have a, a support anymore and because fitbit acquired them one and a half years ago but i still love using that and what happens is the algorithm in the application takes care of my sleep tracking and it has the smart sleep arm function and it just sends a vibration to the smartwatch that also detects my hand movements every night. Um, from time to time, I use the stress device, a stress tracker to, to measure how stressed or calm I am during the day. It didn't help. I found out if I, I tried to reduce my stress, you know, on purpose, it became three times as high. So um, I just had to let this thing go. Um, I've, been, I've been meditating for years and um, I believe that certain technologies like some EEG trackers can be a good start to get into to get to get you on your path towards mindfulness but you can't reach mindfulness with technology so I, I think I learned how to meditate what I need during meditation with these trackers but I don't use them anymore and I just try to remain calm and, and reach mindfulness by meditating every single day you know to be able to stop 
during the Rosh Hashanah day, even if we travel schedules and, and everything else out there, I want to enjoy life at any age. So I, I, I want to reach mindfulness at some point in my life. But the, the biggest amount of information I received from these technologies was from whole genome sequencing and, and my microbiome sequencing. So first I know exactly what major medications would cause me side effects. And that's um, you know golden kind of uh, information. I, I know if I had to take drugs lowering my cholesterol, I would have uh, cardiomyopathy, quite a serious side effect, with a chance of about 95%. So I told my GP, let's avoid taking them. I learned that um, what kind of risks I have for certain conditions. I learned my risk about melanoma, skin cancer. It's quite high compared to the general population, so I know how I, what I can do to prevent it from happening. I learned that um, I have a risk for uh, thrombosis, and if I have to, you know, if I, whenever I have a surgery or something like that, and I have to remain inactive for days, I will have to take some medications to prevent blood clots from uh, taking shape. Um, I learned my risk for um, myocardial infarction after the age of 50-ish or so, based on those studies. I'm, I'm doing everything I, I can do against that. I learned some other minor risks about a few other conditions. I learned useless stuff about my life. Like if I eat asparagus, then I can smell it in my urine that you know changed my life forever, knowing that fact about my health. It's very useful. I learned I have a relationship to Napoleon. So, you know, fun stuff that has no clinical implications, but it's good to know. And, um, and I had a microbiome sequencing service, which means you, know, you have about three, four kilograms of bacteria in your digestive system, and you can have their DNA sequenced by companies by sending fecal sample. And I learned what kind of diet I should have based on my microbiome, because that, that microbiome affects your mental state, depression, sleep quality, many other things, metabolism, and so on. So it's good to know who you are living with. So with I, the mic, with, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say that saying these things out loud, um, I'm sure I sound like an obsessive person about health. <laughs> I'm not, but I just want to, I wanted to discover my options and what I can learn about my current health and the future of my health and, and see what I can do to prevent diseases from happening. But that's why I work closely with my general practitioner who is quite into digital health and, and she's very supportive of, of my initiative here to try to live as long as possible at, you know, at the best quality of life uh, possible. I don't think it's too obsessive. I, I like to, I, I almost have to laugh when people tell me, uh, but I'm not worried about what you're doing. I feel good. I, I'm, doing, I'm doing good. And I'm kind of like, yeah, but do you notice your hair grow? Because I'm pretty sure it grows every day and you don't ever see the changes. You're just suddenly different. It suddenly needs a haircut. And it's, it's a lot like that. With, uh, with the microbiome, so specifically, guys, these are bacteria that live in your gut that process what you're eating. And we've had a couple of interesting episodes, basically can lead to all sorts of disease if you're having in chronic inflammation. What um, My understanding is that your microbiome changes relatively quickly when you change your diet which makes it makes me wonder a little bit how much is chicken and how much is egg when testing for the what your microbiome should be eating versus what you've been eating are you just optimizing that, that, yeah that's a great question i think in a few months it can change quite um, significantly i would say rapidly because before we thought it would take more time for microbiomes to significantly change that's why these companies not just offer you to sequence your microbiome but also they offer probiotics courses that you can take to, to fine tune your microbiome in the direction that, that they provide you with, they suggest to you. Uh, that, that's the plan about that. I think also what, they, what the companies that I tried offer is that you should retest, you reanalyze your microbiome every three, actually six months is a bit better. But every half, you know, twice a year doing that, it gives you quite a clear picture about how it's changing. And if you don't change something significantly in your lifestyle, then you won't see major changes in your microbiome either. And basically healthcare is becoming health, not sick care. So we're moving more towards the prevention model of trying to actually stay healthy, which is way cheaper for everybody. I want to I wanna transition a little bit into what that future of healthcare looks like. I know you did a video recently. Apparently Google's pretty into this, I know. And uh, Amazon's had some interesting moves as well. What do you think about in terms of the future of healthcare, where it's headed, the big tech players? Well, um, let me start from the notion that, that we have to discuss first. It's the kind of system 
that you are living in, uh, I think affects heavily what kind of care you, you receive. So if you live in a country with socialized medicine like I do, then you get access to basic care for free, but there's no money for innovation. So when you see amazing technologies and genomic testing services out there, you, will, you, will, you won't see them in your own healthcare system for decades from now. If you live in a country with a private insurance system, you can get access to the, ama the most amazing innovations right now if you have a good enough coverage, if you are wealthy enough to have great health insurance plan. So many, of, many people are just left out. In the US now, the top 1%, the wealthiest top 1% Americans live 10 years longer than the bottom 1%. And it's not yet about technologies, just the pure access to care. Imagine what happens when advanced technologies become available for everyone out there. So my, my vision about this is that, <clears throat> and it might be, um, you know, um, maybe a too, too brave vision here, but is that healthcare is going to become international. Right now, if I have a um, cancerous tissue, I can submit uh, a biopsy to a Belgian startup where they sequence the DNA of the cancerous tissues looking for driver mutations. These mutations mean that there are some treatments out there right now in the world trying to tackle that specific kind of cancerous tissue. So I could get it done with a Belgian startup from sending out the sample from Hungary. They could use the, the Amazon cloud server in the US to find, to match clinical trials to my cancerous tissues driver mutations. And they might find out that there is a clinical trial going on on a Spanish island made by a French pharma company and a Swiss startup helps me get there and get that clinical trial for free because those companies are very much looking for finding patients like you who have that same cancerous tissue they need. And you get a free clinical trial for the exact mutation that you have. So it's the, the most targeted, most personalized oncological therapy. And I haven't even met anybody in my healthcare system. I'm not saying that's an ideal scenario. I'm just saying that that's where we are heading. As healthcare systems cannot progress fast enough, patients turn to technological solutions. That's what happened in the US when in the past few years, a community of patients with diabetes has grown to be a, a community of many thousand uh, diabetes patients who can now create their own do-it-yourself artificial pancreas systems. There are now artificial pancreas devices on the market, but they are very expensive. And for years, uh, they hadn't been approved by the FDA. So why the, the technology was a viable option, patients couldn't get access to it through the traditional regulated models. So what they did, not like before, they just waited for regulators to come up with the solutions, they turned to technologies and they made their own bionic pancreas system because they didn't want to die from very low blood glucose levels during the night while sleeping, even though, you know, they didn't make a mistake. Uh, their physician didn't make a mistake. They were just metabolically different than other patients. They wanted to avoid that, so they turned to the technological solution. That's still not the ideal scenario, but I absolutely understand that they are moving towards that. That's why people like us, we, we push policymakers and regulators worldwide forward that they have to be in the forefront of innovation to bring these technologies to the market as soon as they are ready. For example, the, the FDA knows that a company in the US called Organovo uh, is about to be able to 3D print um, um, biomaterials, tissues, like liver tissue that can function like a human liver for weeks. And they plan to be able to regulate that kind of technology by the time the company comes up with the first marketed product by 2019. So that, that's what we need. They have to understand these technologies sometimes even better than, than those working on them. And it's dangerous as well, because if you overregulate, everyone just moves to the next country. Why, why do it in the US? Let's go to Mexico. Let's go to the islands. No, China. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of which, what are the most out there things that you're hearing about, the rumors that you're hearing that are happening? A lot of them are probably happening in China, uh, Thailand, et cetera. But what, what are you hearing that you think would be interesting to share? Well, in genetics research, we have always known that, and, and bioethicists love talking about that, but there are some boundaries um, we like to draw up. Um, and there are some countries where those boundaries are not so important or not that strictly regulated. So they can go a bit further down the road of the, you know, towards the ethical nightmare that we all, uh, that we are all afraid of. And we've seen um, experiments coming from China about um, trying to find kids 
with amazing genetic background that might predispose them for becoming better athletes or um, um, high IQ people, which have no which have no real you know scientific background, but still they are trying to do that. We've heard rumors about uh, cloning um, experiments and many dangerous things that we just don't allow in um, other developed countries. But the, the, I think for me, the most exciting rumors have been around the big tech companies diving into healthcare. And we know some of these are not just rumors because they, they hired executives and leaders like Amazon did that a few months ago. Uh, Google appointed a leader for the healthcare division a few days ago. And Microsoft did that about a year ago. So we know that they are, they are moving into that. But seeing big tech companies tackle healthcare issues is, is something very exciting because they what they are really good at is, is customer service and bringing technologies to the market. What they are not so good at that right now is dealing with regulations in healthcare and the reluctance, the general reluctance that we see in healthcare coming from stakeholders who just don't like things to change. And I'm, I'm quite excited about how they will progress with that. I have no doubts that uh, Amazon, um, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Intel, Alibaba will become healthcare providers, at least first for their own employees. But then there's, there, there, can be an, there cannot be any doubts that they will dive into healthcare and they will provide some sort of um, healthcare, uh, I think, worldwide. Especially with Amazon's business model. They build something for themselves, they platformize it, and then they essentially ship it out to the masses. Do you see the big tech companies quite literally killing all, most or all existing healthcare, pharma, et cetera, and just replacing the existing overly expensive paradigm? <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm not sure if they can replace that. It just healthcare doesn't work like that. It's it's not so fast. Um, everyone in healthcare. It's not likes- fast if you play by the rules, but do you have to play by the rules if all consumers want something? That's that's true, but still, healthcare is based on the the evidence based background. So even if you come up with the, if today you come up with as a big tech company today you come up with the best AI solution for, you know, improving healthcare decisions worldwide, and you can show that it's really improving decisions from today, but you have no evidence based study backing your claims, no one will accept that. Even even if it looks like that's the next big, next big thing, evidence based medicine is a is a fundamental you know, the, the ground point for how healthcare works. And I'm, I'm quite okay with that. It's a really important aspect of, of, the, of improving things and, and, and adopting new things in healthcare. But still with regulations, we, even if customers wanted to get it happen, if regulations don't change that fast, they will still be just outlaws. Like how the, the we are not waiting movement, uh, the patients with diabetes I talked about, they, they had been outlaws for many years not you know they they had they have been working on not regulated not safe healthcare devices medical devices for themselves even though if that was understandable but that's just not health, how healthcare is supposed to be working so that the solution here is not let big tech companies become pirates in healthcare but pushing policymakers a bit you know quicker uh, forward to make sure that regulations become viable and and reliable by the time big tech companies can provide technological solutions. Otherwise, it's going to be a dystopian scenario we all try to avoid. Otherwise, we just have a million Theranosis, and that was, that was, <laughs> exactly. a, whole, that was a whole shit show. That's the best example out there. Yeah, we, you know, the way they, they showed false hope, um, it's very dangerous. It, it got many people, even in the industry, hooked up on their idea because the idea was revolutionary. But when you keep on when you keep on um, over-promising something and you keep on not producing evidence-based studies, then our radar, you know, has, has become uh, quite a, a red thing for many months. And then we knew that, that somehow this would just got to the sur- this, would, this would just get to the surface and that it happened, but it's, it's very bad because it's bad for investments in digital health. It's bad for the, the lab testing industry. So we have to be even more vigilant than we have been before. And, and make sure that companies realize no matter how revolutionary technology you are developing right now that can shape the future of healthcare, we need the evidence-based studies coming out from your labs. It's like the boy who cried wolf. How do you think about <laughs> patents in biotech, life sciences, longevity? Wow, you want, to, you want, me to, you want to drag me into that topic? Um, well, you know, it's, um, 
it's really a, a thin ice uh, for pharma companies out there because um, they can keep the patents for a certain amount of years depending on what market they are in or what products they are developing. But that's, that's going to change with the way the citizen scientists are surfacing. You know, there are now methods, laboratory methods that, that anyone can use, anyone can learn quite easily. A CRISPR is obviously a, a great example for, um, it's not just genome editing, but in a way you can, in a much easier way, edit uh, DNA like never before. And when citizen scientists can start using those methods, then, you know, who's going to get, who's going to have the patent? Um, on the, the innovations they come up with. Or what if my DNA is the key for such an innovation, then am I part of the patent or is just about the company? So um, it's very thin ice for all of them. And right now, the bigger the company is, the higher chance they have to, to push these things through the way they want it to happen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. We'd like to think that we want to make people healthier, but... We've seen with pharma, that's not always, uh, not always the case. That's a whole nother can of worms. You said you thought you would live to, or your goal was not an optimistic. You thought it was generally speaking pretty, pretty doable, a hundred. What would you say is the, the 50% chance? Let's say you got a 50% chance of living longer. How long would that be? Well, just to be, you know, to see it, to look at the Gaussian curve here, if it's a 50% chance, then I have a 50% chance to die at 60 from a blood clot that I I have genetically running in my family, or a 50% chance to live at least to a 120-ish. There was a great paper in Nature a few months ago claiming that the the biological um, um, threshold might be around or just below 130. And I think it it just involves the the biological features we have, but it, it didn't discuss the digital health technologies that we might develop by then. So if I, if I live, if I have a middle age crisis at the age of 65 ish, that sounds okay. And then from, from there, um, I could have digital tattoos, even it's a very brave idea, but maybe nanobots in my bloodstream checking for changes. And, and if there is something about to get wrong, they will let me know so I can get to medical help even before I would need it. And then from bioprinting human organs, uh, liver is quite viable, uh, spleen, skin, bone, uh, cartilage, these things, they have been shown that these tissues can be printed out with 3D printers already. So assuming that in 30, 40 years, uh, we could print out such organs that could be transplantable, I think it's quite a viable scenario. So if we build these technologies into that system, then the 50% chance is I think around 120, but it's, it's a key point that until that time, it would be a general quite high quality of life, not a downhill from the age of 80 or something, you know. Um, Albert Sandjordi, the who discovered vitamin C back then, at the, I think he, was, he, he had his uh, 85th birthday and reporters asked him to what age he would like to go back. And he said he, he wished he would be 65 again. That's what I shoot for to you know, have the best moments in my life at, at that age, from 60, 70, 80. And then from there, it would be a more focused approach towards keeping that, that level of health quality that I have. That, that's just, of course, you know, saying things out loud and, and trying to have a vision about the future. But the life expectancy we have right now is still not influenced by the technologies that will become available in about 10, 15 years from now. And 10 or 15 years technologies are a lot different than 50 to 60 year technologies. So exactly. depend, depending, do you think, do you believe in the escape velocity for longevity or do you think that that's something that's more of a sci-fi fantasy, at least for now? I'm afraid that's more of a, it, to me, it seems like it's more of a sci-fi fantasy for now. To, to make, to make it um, a reality, it would mean that populations of people should be, should already start living um, a proactive database life and and i'm not sure if people just you know if you if you can nudge people into that direction by themselves they would just not live like someone from 10 years from that time point so that's that that sounds more like science fiction it, it sounds similarly like how uh, um, uh cryonics and uh, cryogenics sounds today that we know that there are more than 300 people uh cryogenized like now right now so they are they are they when they chose to to get into a 
it's not even you know frozen it's um it's a vitrification fluid that they have now in their body and after they died the company alcor uh, got their bodies and they 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 swept the bodily fluids they had with the vitrification fluid it's like a gloss so that cells are not crystallized and with the hope that at one day they would get woken up when there is a cure for diseases that that led to their death that's still just you know science fiction even though we have those people in those in those um, uh, rooms right now it's, it's just science fiction does your gut tell you it'll be possible in the next 200 500 years or no oh 200 five, of course that's <laughs> no, it's, it's so easy to say things like that of course everything is going to be possible by then if we can you know keep on having a uh, humanity until then if we don't destroy ourselves with either you know climate change or artificial intelligence or just or just um, starting to reject technologies because we are we would be afraid of uh, of our lives being replaced by them there are so many issues to solve before that that answering your previous question i would be happy to provide people with a good quality of life until 80 or 90 but i mean good quality until the last days rather than shooting for 130 and 40 for for many people i would love to just have a a good long healthy life rather than having an even longer life, but with a deteriorating uh, level of quality. Yeah, if your lifespan isn't pretty darn close to your health span, then eventually your life sucks. Exactly. So you brought, up a, you brought up a couple of terrifying possibilities and problems the world's facing. What's the biggest- That's my job to do. What's the biggest fear or, or scare that you have? It can be technological, it can be societal, it can be climate change, it can be anything. I, I think it's two. One, one is because of the, the, the work I do, and it's that, the um, Thomas Kuhn had an amazing book about the structure of scientific revolutions. He perfectly laid out the foundations of how paradigm shifts happen in science, in every any you know branches of science. And the big revelation about his book was that science isn't developing like a pyramid that you build knowledge on previously had known knowledge, and then you build a pyramid. It's it's actually a circle, and there's a there's a, a model that you're using in that branch of science. A new model comes in, there is a war between them, and there's a paradigm shift, and it's a cultural change, and people start using the new model, and from there we have that new kind of circle. That, that's what happened when evidence-based medicine became, became available. Before them, physicians just you know, used the methods they learned in medical school, in education, the way they, they, they had discussions with colleagues, they had experience, and, and the way they, they chose methods based on that. Even if the same method led to you know, dying patients or side effects, if there was no data against it, they kept on using the same thing. And then evidence-based medicine came. If there is a study for that, then you are allowed, you are, you are actually um, encouraged to use that method because there is evidence that it works. It's amazing, it was a paradigm shift. And I think digital health is the new paradigm shift. And my fear is that because of the major reluctance we see from people in healthcare, it will, not, it will, not, it will just not you know, be able to, to make that shift. And we will keep on, being in the same circle, which is analog, that um, I might die from a stroke at the age of 55, or I might live to an I might live to 90, smoking every day. Who knows? And that's that's okay. Now I, I want people to say out loud that if that I don't want my life to depend on pure luck. That's what I'm saying out loud. Or if you're okay with that, that's absolutely fine. But I want you to say out loud, I'm fine if my life depends on pure luck. Until, because now you depend more on your healthcare system than your own decision. And I want people to depend on their own decisions more. And for this, we need that paradigm shift towards digital health. That's the, the smaller fear I have, because I have actually no doubts that this paradigm shift will just go through. The bigger fear is obviously artificial intelligence, that we think we, are, we have the best product or brain in the, uni in the known universe. What if we don't? What if we, we have a black box with AGI and the next moment when it has the chance to talk to a, a person, it will just get out. The Ex Machina, the movie, is an amazing example for that. What if? And from there, we are literally doomed. We won't be able to, to regulate it, to look through the developments. We won't even understand what it's working on. And from there, we will, fear, we will feel inferior to something else. And I, I, that might be the end of humanity. It could be, but you could argue that ants don't feel that about us, so it's hard to guess. In yeah, terms of in terms of the, in terms of the sure. difference, they may be at a totally different level. So I have I have two last questions for you, and this one's going to have to be a quick one. 
it's, it's slightly controversial, but how much of that wanting to leave things up to fate is just due to humanity's religious history? <laughs> that's you. That, that's the question you need a short answer for. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think we are, I don't even want to stick it to religion, religions. I want to stick it to the way society is structured today, that you are elements of it. You, you have to buy things. You have to live your life the way they were told you were told. And that, that's it. That, that's a good thing that, that, you know there is a path in front of you and you will walk through that. But um, what if that's not the, the right path for all of us? What if I, I don't want to accept that anything can happen to me and then the healthcare system will take care of me? What if I want to take care of myself? What if I want to be a proactive partner? What if I want to actively look for things I can prevent from happening? Because, you know, in most cases, prevention today is just about catching diseases early. That's not enough for me. I don't want to catch them early. I want to prevent them from happening. And I'm happy to give up some of my privacy and, and use some advanced tools and technologies to make it happen. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's about religion rather than the way society is structured today. Give up some of the privacy, says the man. We took five minutes to get the webcam working. <laughs> It's a funny one. Uh, Bercy, I got one last question for you before we wrap things up and tell people where to find you. Quote, call to action, something you'd want to leave people with. What would it be and why? I would really love people if, if anyone would just start using, tracking something. I'm not even talking about buying a health tracker. The, the, the first thing I did was not buying a fitness tracker. I, at the age of um, 13, literally since then, every day I give a score to my physical health, so how, how um, healthy I'm feeling, my mental health, how focused I am, and to my emotional health, how, how happy I am between one and 10. On paper, uh, for the last few years, I've been doing that on Excel spreadsheet, but you know, that's still the same. I learned so much about just, just by giving these scores to my physical, mental, and emotional health in a week or so, that I, I learned about my own algorithm. I learned that if I want to be happy on the long term, I have to be cognitively active and focused day by day. And I learned that I'm more focused every day if I exercise enough. So that's my algorithm. I have to exercise 30 minutes on average, even if I don't want to, to be able to focus better. And this way, I just become generally happy uh, with people around me and the stuff that I'm working on. So if just be we become a little bit more conscious about how we feel in our lives, then from there, we could learn so many things that could be improved with technologies, fitness trackers, sleep trackers, whatever else. But that's where it starts, simple scores on a paper or a spreadsheet. It's the, it's the secret algorithm to happiness and living longer. I like it. Where's the best place for people to find you, Bercy? Well, it's, it's medicalfuturist.com. I have a YouTube channel. I'm very active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and also Instagram. But I publish three articles on medicalfuturist.com, analysis, reports about the future of healthcare, how we can prepare, how we can quantify your health, what we can do today as physicians, patients, or policymakers, researchers, developers, to bring digital health to the masses, to make patients the point of care. So it's medicalfuturist.com. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. We'll throw links and everything in the show notes, guys. Disruptors.fm. Just search for it. Mesco is probably the best way to find it. M-E-S-K-O. Thanks for coming today. Awesome. That was good. You need to jump on it.